I think it's beneficial to all of us, and I hope that it'll be something that'll really, really be a blessing to us, because we've already established in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, that there's a blessing on those who read this book and heed the words to it. And so my whole goal is that uh, uh, we'll be able to kind of really glean and learn a lot from these things that we're learning. But I want to stress again, guys, I cannot uh, sh stress this importance that the most important part of the book is chapters 2 and 3. I like what we did on Wednesday, the other Charles that came to me, he said, man, I, he said, I just don't see why pastors just won't really dig with those seven churches. He said, what, what Christ is saying to the church is so important. And I said, yeah, we just totally just whiff on those things. This, this is Jesus' last words to his church. Now, you may argue with Paul. You may argue with what Peter wrote. You may not know who wrote the book of Hebrews. You may argue with this and that. But you cannot argue with what Christ said. That's right. And this is what Jesus is saying to his church. And guess what, guys? He's just not saying this to those seven churches in, in, in Asia Minor. This is to all churches everywhere in all times. So this is for us. Are we a part of the church? Yes. So who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to us. And immediately, guys, when we read these churches as a pastor, you know, I, I'm always intrigued of how would Jesus open up a letter to my church? Mm -hmm. well, I mean, would I get one of these? I mean, honestly, you have to think about that. What, what letter would he open up to you? You know, mm -hmm. what, what address would he give you? Right. I guarantee you, it's not God has a wonderful plan for your life. It, it's, not, it's not all of what they're telling us. Amen. And we're seeing this as we read these letters that Jesus loves his church. That Jesus is protective of his church, but the church is his bride. And he's going to protect his church. He's going, to, he's going to defend his church. He's going to bless his church. He's going to heal his church. He's going to prosper in his church. He's going to do all those great things. Mm -hmm. Guys, he's also going to judge his church. Right. He's going to purge his church. <laughs> and he's going to do it, and we'll find out in this letter as we go forth. Uh, so, one, right quick, and let's start at verse 10. Chapter 1, verse 10. Chapter 1, verse 10. Let's start there as we get ready to go deep into this letter. 1, verse 10. And I'll read verse 10 to you. And it says, And I was in the Spirit. This is John speaking. Remember, John is the transcriber of the letter. Uh, we always want to keep in our minds that John is not writing this letter out from his own. This is not John's personal vision to the church. This is the vision of Jesus Christ that God gave to Christ for him to give to the church. And so John is just the transcriber. And that's what it means to say he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He was carried off into the spirit. And then it says, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, I mean, that's a blast. It was something that caught his attention uh, saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. <coughs> now, what we know, John knew these churches. John knew these churches because this book is written around A.D. 95, and John is the last remaining apostle of the church. So John was really the bishop of all of these churches. He is the last living apostle. This is the closing of the first century. This is around A.D. 95, so John knew these churches. It's not like John is sitting here and Jesus is giving us these names. And John's like, where are these churches at? I ain't never heard of them. No, John knows exactly who these churches are. He knows exactly who the pastors are. He knows exactly, watch this, guys, what's going on in the churches. So John is very aware of what these churches are about because he is the bishop, if you will, of this entire area. Remember, this is AD 95, so what had already happened? The temple already been sacked in Jerusalem. Remember, uh, Jerusalem had already been burned to the ground. The temple had been completely destroyed. The Jews in Jerusalem had been totally dispersed throughout all the Roman Empire because Rome never wanted to keep them together again. So they, Rome dispersed them throughout the whole empire. And so John found himself clean, if you will, to Ephesus. So John, uh, Mary, uh, so, uh, some of the other, uh, 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 Timothy and Titus and all of them, they found refuge, if you will, in Ephesus. And so there, John was the pastor of the church of Ephesus during the reign of Domitian. And Domitian came, and then he exiled John to the island of Patmos. And so this is how we get the backdrop of this letter. And so when we think about this, we always want to point this out, because these are real churches. These are real churches. This is not allegory. This is not typology. This is real churches having real issues in the, at the end of the first century. So this is important when we understand this because many people, when you talk to, to them about the book of Revelation, especially in the Protestant church, 
especially in the Protestant church, even in reform circles, a lot of times they tend to view the book of Revelation as allegory. Or they say all those things have already happened. God is just giving us allegory. He's giving us a bunch of typology. So in other words, they read the whole Bible as literal up to Revelation. And then in Revelation, God just switches over to allegory. That doesn't make any sense. It's the same way how people read Genesis. They read Genesis chapter 1 and it's allegory. Adam and Eve wasn't really people. God didn't really form the earth in six days. Come on, you can't really believe that. All that is allegory. All that is typology. And then all of a sudden, in chapter 3, now we get to the real stuff. That doesn't make any sense. You cannot interpret any document like that. Because there are no rules for interpretation. No. Either you believe God created the earth and the universe in six literal days, or you don't believe the Bible. <laughs> Amen. Amen. There's no in-between there. It, there's no in between there, and, and then God. Furthermore, well, I will get off of it because I get off of the tangent with the science stuff. Mm -hmm. But these are real churches. Say they're real churches. Yeah, they're real churches. <laughs> and so these seven letters we t we talked about this. They were serve as a report card, and uh, just to, just to kind of refresh your memory. Remember, there's seven elements to it. You have the name of the church, which is important. The name of the church is important. Then you have the title that Jesus used to describe himself. Then you have the commendations that Jesus gives, the concerns that Jesus gives, the exhortation or admonition that Jesus gives, depending. Sometimes it's an exhortation and no admonition. Then sometimes it's just all admonition. Admonition is just a word meaning warning. Jesus gives a warning to the church. Then number six, we have the promise that he gives. He gives a promise to the overcomer. And then seven, we have the closing. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And so it's with that closing that we get how these letters apply to us. What did we say? Anybody remember? They have four main levels of application. First, local application, meaning that what is written to that church is applicable to that church. Jesus is dealing with real issues that were going on in that church. Okay? So you never want to forget that. You always want to make sure you first observe that this is a local letter written to a local church. So that's the first way that it applies. Number two, it applies also to all churches. How do you know that? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Guess what? So guess when Jesus writes to Thyatira, is applicable to Pergamos, to Laodicea, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Smyrna, to Ephesus. It's, it's applicable to all churches. More importantly, guys, all churches during all times everywhere. Okay? That's the second application. And then number three, there's a personal application. How do we know that? He that hath an ear, let him hear. That's a personal application. Meaning that what Jesus is writing to this church, it personally applies to you. It personally applies to me. See, it's easy to just sit back, Jim, and just say, oh, that's to the church. Well, I hope you don't think Jesus is talking to brick and mortar. I hope you don't think he's talking to wood and floors and chairs and lights and speakers. No, who is the church? The church is made up of the called out ones. All the word, word church means is iglesia in, in Greek. It is the called out ones. Those who have been called out. Well, guess what, guys? If you're saved, you've been called out from the world. And you make up the church. So it's a personal application. And then, more, more or less, the more controversial part would be the prophetic application. Because you have a lot of scholars who don't agree on the prophetic thing. They say, oh, it's not talking about that. But you can deny it. And the reason why we know that there is a prophetic implication there, because why, we, why does Jesus write to these churches? And furthermore, if these churches were given in any other order, you couldn't even have the prophetic message. Because each one of these churches outlines a church age. And guys, we've already gone through Ephesus, which outlined the first century church. Then we went through Smyrna, which was the persecuted church that deals with the, the, the church age all the way from the close of the first century, all the way roughly running into the time of Constantine, would have been the early part of the fourth century. Then we talked about which was the compromising church. That church age would have ran right around the third of the fourth century, all the way through around the seventh century. We have that compromising church. That was when the, the church was marrying the world. Hmm. Remember Constantine? He comes and he makes uh, he he doesn't make Christianity the official religion of Rome, 
That comes by his predecessor, well, the two predecessors after him. But what Constantine does is he lifts the persecution. He makes Christianity legal throughout the Roman Empire. And he himself, that's what they say according to history, he became a Christian. And so that he, he, what he did, what Constantine did is he exempted pastors from taxes. He exempted churches from taxes. Uh, the, church, the pastors became paid member of, members of the state. Churches were then turned from to pagan temples to, to now Christian churches. All you did is just put a name on You know, Let's say this temple was built to Diana. Mom, all you did just took Diana down and put your name up there. Wow. Didn't do anything with the church. The church the church still pagan to the core, but you just put a Christian name on it. Mm. He took pagan festivals and just turned them into Christian festivals. Mm. He took pagan titles and he just assumed see, this is when the church married the world. And so that's when we get it. This prophetic. But now when we get into Thyatira, we're dealing with a long age here. This is known as the corrupt church, but better known, it's known as the medieval church. And it runs you throughout pretty much the 6th century, 7th century, all the way to the Reformation, and a little bit beyond. So we're going to see some things about this church. Well, today, guys, we're going to get into that fourth church, which is what I'm talking about, Thyatara. Thyatara, which is known as the corrupt church. Now listen to this. Even though Thyatara is the smallest city of the seven major cities of Asia Minor, it is the church whom the Lord writes the longest letter to. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? This is the smallest city of all the seven, but it has the longest letter. But now, in order for us to cover all of this material, because the material in the letter to Thyatara is so complex, you can't just do it in one city. Okay, It will be here to the Super Bowl. And we don't want to do that. So, so we're not going to try to do that. And I'm not just saying that so we can run out here and watch Super Bowl, because honestly, I don't care who wins. Go Kansas City. But at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, because I'm not rooting for Cal Shanahan. He messed us up. He, he, he lost out one Super Bowl. So we deal with these churches, guys. I want us to truly understand that in order to get through this letter, it's going to take us some time. So it's going to take us at least this message, we're going to talk about it again on Wednesday. We'll talk about it on Sunday. And we'll talk about it again on the next following Wednesday. So we're looking at about four messages dealing with five targets. That's how important this church is. We're going to take our time. And trust me, you're going to want me to take our time as we talk about these things dealing with this church. Okay? So let's look at it a little bit, guys. The letter to Thyatara follows closely to the letter of Pergamus. Anybody did your reading this week? Did you notice that the letter to Thyatara runs a little same like Pergamus? It runs the same. Now watch this, guys. The letter to Thyatara reveals to us the full outgrowth of Jesus' concerns he gave to the church of Pergamos. So remember the concerns that he gave to Pergamos. He, the, the, he was concerned that you have a church full of believers there, a couple of unbelievers there, but Christ is concerned that you guys are compromising. That's what he's concerned with. So when we get to Thyatara, we see the full outgrowth of the compromise. You see that? Watch this, guys. What we discover is that what was beginning to take place in Pergamos has come to full strength in Thyatara. One commentator said it like this, if the church of Pergamos had married the culture around them, they were now celebrating anniversaries in Thyatara. Mm -hmm. I like that. I thought that was kind of amusing. If Pergamos was marrying the culture, Thyatara did anniversaries. They're knee deep in it. They're not just compromising in Thyatara. They are wholly given over to corruption. The idolatry in Thyatara is the false doctrine. And, 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 and watch this, guys. The immorality is the sin. This church is wholly given over to it. They're not even trying to hide. They're not even trying to change. They are wholly given over to it. Furthermore, the church in Thyatara marks the beginning of the remaining churches like Sardis and Laodicea, who will be scolded by the Lord. It marks the beginning of where now there will be more false believers in the churches than there are believers. Y'all remember that? Wednesday we talked about that with Pergamos. 
Pergamos marks the end of the church that has more believers than false believers. Thyatira starts the trend of there being now more false believers than believers. Because the believers in Thyatira are called, you. it says, and to the rest of you all in Thyatira. Who, who hold, he tells them, Christ says, the whole fast. See, those are the true believers. Notice that the true believers in Thyatira are called the rest. By the time you get to Sardis, the believers are called a few. Jesus said, man, you got a few there who ain't sold their garments. Me? Everybody else that ain't sold their garments. And then when you get to Laodicea, Jesus says, I'm going to spit the whole church out of my mouth. Wow. This starts to trend, guys. That's why it's such an important letter. Because in Pergamos, guys, there were only a few false believers in that church that were compromising and trying to corrupt the church. Remember, Jesus says, remember in Jesus' concerns, come on, guys, y'all remember, Jesus tells the church of Pergamos, you have a few there who hold the of Balaam and hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. He said, you got a few there. That's what he tells them over there in Pergamos. But watch this, guys, in Thyatira, you now have the leader of the church teaching false doctrine and teaching the whole church to engage in sexual immorality. You hear that other child? This isn't a few. You got the pastor who teaching false doctrine and teaching people to worship idols and engage in sexual immorality. You see how the corruption is? Mm -hmm. Wow. The church in Thyatira is not only tolerating error and sin, they are being consumed with it and living happily ever after with it. Mm -hmm. They're consumed with it. It is correctly called the corrupt church. So let's read the letter. Let's read it. Verse 18. We're going to read the whole letter. Let's just get the whole flavor of it. Let's all take it in. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 through 29. Let's read. It says, I'll read it. It says, And the angel of the church of Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who, are, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like varnished bronze. I know your works, your love, your faith, your servants, and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and is teaching and seducing my servants, my true servants, mind you that, to practice sexual immorality and to eat a food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a sick bed, and adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her words. Notice that he's not no longer telling her to repent. But he's telling those who have committed adultery, you know, y'all need to repent. So what does that say for this Jezebel well, pastor? Uh, that's it for you. I'm going to throw her in. But watch this, guys. It, it, it gets worse. And it says in verse 23, And I will strike her children dead, mm -hmm. and churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Mm -hmm. Whew. Boy. Mm -hmm. right. Not only am I going to kill Jezebel, I'm going to kill her children. We're not making these words up. This is the same guy who walked the streets of Nazareth and Galilee. Look what he says in verse 24. The rest in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what Psalm called the deep things of Satan. I mean, they, they done got into the deep things of Satan. To you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, and to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, as in earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as if myself have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Wow. What a letter. What a letter. Let's look at the title of Christ first, guys. Let's look at verse 18. Jump back to verse 18. 
Notice in verse 18 it says, And to the angel of the church of Thyatira. Remember we talked about angel is angelos. That's the messenger. <laughs> Jesus is talking to the leader of the church, or the pastor of the church, the elder of the church. He says, To the angel of the church of Thyatira, write this. He's, what, he's telling John, I want you to write this to the leader. The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like varnished bronze. That's Jesus' title. That he now let's look at this right quick, guys. Like the letter to Pergamos. Remember, what does the letter of Pergamos open up with? It, to him, it says, to the angel to the church of Pergamos, write. It says, from the one who has the sword coming out of his mouth. Say this. Notice to this church, he starts off this letter. Words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like bronze bronze. Guys, just like the letter to Pergamos, Jesus is opening a dream meant to bring comfort. It's meant to strike terror. He's, remember what we said? If I wrote you a letter and I started off my letter that says this letter is coming from the one with the shotgun. How many of you know you're going to be like, okay, what he write? If I start off my letter like that, this is from the one who's been spying on you and I know everything you're doing. <laughs> Uh, okay, what you about to say? Are you getting what I'm saying, guys? This isn't meant to say, oh, ooh, man, sing the song, key the organ. This is so great. No, no, no. You read this title, you know that Christ is he, he's coming to say something. That's right. And guys, as we've been saying, Jesus is selecting this title from the description that John sees of the Lord moving in the midst of his church in chapter 1. Mm -hmm. And so look at it, guys. The title Jesus selects for this church speaks directly to the issues facing the particular church he's addressing. The meaning when he picks the title, he's not just arbitrarily picking it, he's picking it because it addresses what's going on in the church. He's telling you, this is how I'm coming to that church. Well, first of all, you notice that he says, the Son of God. Do you know this is the only reference to the Son of God in the entire book? Throughout the entire book, Jesus is called the Son of Man. But here... He says, to the Son of God who has eyes like flames of fire and whose feet like varnished bronze. Why did he start off that, guys? This speaks of the deity of Jesus Christ. Say deity. deity. In other words, guys, he speaks of the deity. Remember, if you go back over to chapter 1 and verse 13, when John describes Jesus, when he turns around and sees Jesus, he sees Jesus as the Son of Man. Remember, John sees him as the son of man. That speaks of Jesus and his humanity. This is going to help you out. When you hear son of man, what is that talking about of Christ? That's speaking of his humanity. When you hear son of God, that is speaking of his what? His deity. His deity. That's what that's speaking of, guys. The title son of man is always used to speak of Christ in his compassion. Christ in his sympathetic work as high priest of those whom he has redeemed. In other words, when we hear the Son of Man, guys, I love it, man. It speaks of Christ and his compassion and his, and his humanity and his sympathetic work as the high priest. When you go to, I think it's uh, uh, probably uh, chapter 4, or maybe, no, chapter 5, it says when John is looking and, and there, there, there's God holding a great hole in his hand, right. and, uh, and the angels are saying, who has the authority? Who, who is worthy to open the scroll? Who's worthy to open? And it says that they looked around and they saw no man in all of creation who can do it. And John starts to weep. This is in Revelation chapter 5. Right. And then all of a sudden the angel touches John and says, Do not weep, for the Son of Man has prevailed. And then when John turns around, he sees a lamb that was slain. Amen. But when Jesus goes to the throne, it describes him as the lamb. Y'all get this? That means that to the believer, say to the believer, we always know him as the lamb. You better pray you don't know him as the lion. Because to his enemies, he's going to be the lion. To us, he is the son of man. Yes, he is. We know he's God in the flesh, but he's the son of man. He is the one who took on sin on our behalf. Who took who took building of the cross on our behalf so that we could be redeemed. That's how we know. And that's why we love him. Yes, he is God. But here, guys, he is announcing himself as God. 
Here Jesus identifies himself as the Son of God, signifying that the one who is the Son of Man, Jesus of Nazareth, is the eternal Son of God, Christ the Lord. Him who is the Son of Man is the Son of God. That's what it literally is. The title Son of God is not talking about progeny. We know that. It's not talking about biological spring. It is literally an ancient idiom, if you will, talking about Jesus being co-equal and co-eternal with God. So when Jesus says he's the son of God, because I had this whole conversation with these Jehovah's Witnesses, and I mean, you know, they was at the door, and I, I probably spent like 30 or 40 minutes with them, because they was like, who are you out there fussing with? I said, I wasn't fussing with anybody. I said, back and forth, and if I could have got the little young man that was with the older Jehovah's Witness, I could have got him. Because I, I just, I wasn't even talking to the other little guy, I'm talking to this young little guy, he's just looking at me, Okay, that makes sense. Okay. And they don't treat no such thing. And so we're going back and forth. He said, he's the son of God. He's I said, what do you think that means? You think God had a son? I said, all that is speaking about is Jesus in, in saying that he's co-equal with God. He's co-eternal with God. Jesus is literally saying that I'm God. He said, no, oh, no. Jesus is created by God. I said, no. I said, and you're worshiping another Jesus. And when we left off in the conference, I said, I'm going to pray for you guys. I said, I'm going to pray that you get saved. I said, because you don't know Christ. The Christ that you're believing in is not a Christ that's saved. And you should have saw the look on that young black guy. He was like. I said, oh, oh, oh. That's right, telling the truth. Oh. And Jesus says he's the son of God. Guys, this isn't this is some Mormon religion where God had a son. No, this is speaking that Jesus said, I'm co-equal with God. I'm co-eternal with God. I'm co-existing with God. Before Abraham was, I am. Right, right, right. Jesus is the absolute deity. He is none other than God himself, the second person of the Trinity. Jesus asked himself, watch this, emphasizing his, de his deity, the Thyatara, because he's not coming to them as the sympathetic son of man. He's coming to them as deity bringing judgment. Amen. Amen. Oh. You get it? Okay, I'm not coming to you guys as the son of man. I'm coming to you as the son of God. I'm coming as the son of God who tolerates no sin. Who is in absolute perfection and holiness. That's how I'm coming. And that's why he announces to them this in, in, in this whole thing, guys. When you look at it, as a matter of fact, if you jump down to verses 22 in the letter, in verse 22, this is stressed in verse 22. How do I know Jesus is judgment? Look at his pronouncement to Jezebel. Look, look He's, he's pronounced a false leader. Look what he says. He's going to throw her mm -hmm. on a bed of death. Mm -hmm. I know it says sickness, but it's probably a talicized. No, he's going to throw her in a bed of death. Mm -hmm. Or oh, you want to commit sexual immorality? I'll give you a bed, all right. <laughs> it's a play on work. Okay. It's a play on work. What is she talking about? He says, I gave her time to, to repent of her sexual immorality. But she will not repent. So here's what she says. Well, Jesus said, okay, you want a bed? I'll throw you on a bed. I'll throw you on a bed of death. And look at the judgment that he pronounces on her children. I'm going to kill all them. Guys, this is not the son of man talking. This is the son of God coming, judging sin, guys. Because the question then we look at this, guys. Well, well, why is he bringing this type of judgment? Look at the rest of that part in verses 23. It says, so what? All the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Guys, that's God speaking. God says, because well, somebody said, well, why? Why are you throwing Jezebel on a, bed, on a sick bed? Why are you killing her children? So all the churches will know. That I'm the one that searches minds and hearts. Right. And I will give to every man according to his works. That's why I'm doing it. Right. So, if you're down in Sardis, are you over in Pergamos? Are you over in, oh my God. And you know you're playing around with a little, a little false. You know you got some sexual immorality. Going on. Guess what? That's going to get your attention. Y'all follow him here. And then what else did he say? The eyes like the one who has what? His, his eyes are like. His eyes are not on fire. This isn't Superman. This is this, 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 he, j, j, what, what John is describing, guys, his eyes are like. Like. 
It's a, what would it be? A simile. As we said in our study of chapter 1, this is speaking of Jesus' laser precision vision. It is a picture of penetrating omniscience that knows all things and nothing can hide from his divine knowledge and sight. That's what it's talking about. He has eyes like flames of fire. Jesus is not the son of man. Jesus, watch this, Jesus, not as the son of man, but as the glorious son of God, sees through to the heart of every man. And more specifically, he sees every man's heart that is a member of his church. <laughs> Jesus is letting you know that I'm the one that sees everybody in my church. There is nothing that you can do, nothing that I do, nothing that we think, nothing that we say that goes unnoticed by the Lord of the church. He sees what goes on in the booth in the back in the corner. He knows what you do when we say amen and the benediction closes. He knows what your Monday is like, your Tuesday is like, your Wednesday is like, your Friday and Friday. He knows exactly what you did last night. He knows what you did on Friday. He knows what you did on Thursday. This is what this is conveying to us, God. He has eyes like flame of fire. Now, if that don't put terror in the heart of those who name the name of Christ, I don't know what will. Because, you know, you got believers today. I don't care if he is looking. Wow. Psalms 139 says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know, watch this, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is in my tongue, behold, oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is, I cannot attain it. Look at what the psalmist says, man. And I didn't read the whole psalm. He said, man, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. He said, you knew me before I was formed in my womb. Furthermore, he knows my thoughts. Mercy, Lord. Won't be that long. <laughs> you know what you're thinking right now. What this is saying to us, guys, is that there's no fool in Christ. There's no escaping his divine knowledge and his divine judgment. That's what it's saying. And lastly, he identifies himself as whose feet are like varnished bronze. Uh, when we read this varnished bronze, literally what it's saying there is his feet were glowing. His, like when, when John saw it, his feet were like glowing like they had been in fire. They were like, they were glowing bright red. That's what literally what it's saying. It's not saying he had brass feet. He's not trying to describe ethnicity here. Because you have this one person, people say, he's black. Okay, see. <laughs> Furthermore, guys, I'm not reading the verse. It says his feet were like. That's a simile. What does that mean, guys? In the Old Testament, frying brass and bronze was always used in fires because brass and bronze were a kind of metal that could withstand the intense heat from fire. As a matter of fact, guys, it's always pictured in the Old Testament as judgment. Do you know the brazen? You know the brazen altar. Mm -hmm. The we call it the brazen altar. All that's saying that it was it was a brass altar that right. set before the temple, or in the temple it's set in the outer court area, and then in the tabernacle it's set on the outer area as well. It was a big brazen or brass temple, and there a, 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 a altar. There they kept the fires burning continually. Right. And so why brass? Because it could withstand the fire. What is this talking about, guys? This is a picture of Christ coming. Say coming. coming. Why do we say coming? Feet. Mm -hmm. Feet. His feet on fire. 
He's coming to Thyatira in divine bringing with him divine judgment. Meaning that he's coming to Thyatira ready to tread down his enemies. He's coming ready to stamp out He's coming ready to stamp out the immorality, stamp out the idolatry. He's, that's why his feet are on fire. This is Jesus walking in the church. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 and 13 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and no creature is hid from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eye to whom we must give an account. Mm. My Lord. Mm. Amen. Roscoe, <laughs> it's safe to say nobody wants to get this level. Huh? <laughs> If I open this up, Ron, I'm going to call Ron up here. Yeah, Ron, you read this, man. I'm going to sit outside. Because <laughs> I, I don't even want to read what he's about to say. Because if this is how he's coming, I already know. I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Amen. Yeah, you're in trouble. As I pray, eternal purpose will open up with our love. I hope here in this ministry we have more believers than we do unbelievers. And I, I tend to believe we have more believers than false believers. I do. I believe that here. But God knows. Jesus knows. I, I do. I believe, I believe that we have more believers than we do false believers. I don't believe nobody's faking. But only God knows our heart. And that's why we have to read these letters. Amen. Amen. Don't say, oh, pastor said we straight. I ain't saying that. Because I'm not. I, I, hey, look here. Don't you go by that. No. <laughs> you search your own heart. <laughs> you examine your own self to see if you're in the faith. Don't go by my word. Because I'm examining myself. I ain't going by what I just said. Give me this, guys. The question must be, why is the Lord coming to this church like this? Well, let's look a little bit at the city. Located halfway between Pergamos and Sardis was this little valley city known as Thyatara. Remember my little fake map I be putting up on? Remember you got Ephesus here? You go up 50 miles, you have uh, Smyrna. You go up another 40 miles, you have Pergamos. Mm -hmm. Then you start making your descent down. Mm -hmm. Then you have Thyatar, and then you have Sardis. Then you have Philadelphia, and way down at the ba base of Asia Minor, you have Laodicea. Mm -hmm. And we said this is known as the ancient postal route. Mm -hmm. The ancient postal route of Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. And so this city was located like really halfway, if you will, 40 miles each way between Pergamos and Sardis. It was a valley city. It's set in the valley. You see? So in other words, you have, remember we talked about uh, Pergamos. Pergamos set where? Anybody remember? Yeah, there you go, Liz. It set a thousand feet above sea level. So Pergamos is the city on the hill. And then if you came down that hill, you see, in the valley, 40 miles in the valley, you have this little bitty city known as Thyatar. Because Thyatar set in the flat, open, uh, uh, wide open river valley, 40 miles down from Pergamos, it lacked any natural fortification against attacks. So in other words, if you know anything about military strategy, if you came to this city, if, 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 if me went to this city, we ain't making no military garrison here because we already know, man, we got no, no fortification. Y'all understand what fortification is? Think about America. America has fortification against attack. Anybody know how? What is on each side of us? Two big old oceans. So in other words, to get to America, you got to fly over the Pacific. We're going to get you there. And then you got to get over the Atlantic. We're going to get you there. And then also buffering us, you got Canada up there. And then you got Mexico. So, so what happens is you have natural fortification. Well, if you're five tar, you got nothing. You just have absolutely nothing. Therefore, this city has a long history of being attacked, conquered, destroyed, and then rebuilt. Attack, conquer, destroy, and rebuild. If you go study it out, this is the history of Thyatar. Mm -hmm. the, the city of Thyatar actually served as a buffer to Pergamos. Mm -hmm. So here's the deal. So if you got an army, you invade. Mm -hmm. To get to that Pergamos, where's Pergamos at? On the top of the hill. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So 
Guess what a little thigh tar serves as? It serves as a buffer. It's almost like a slowdown right. mm. before you get to Pergamus. So what Pergamus would use Thyatara as as the little buffer. So, okay, let's kill all the people and destroy Thyatara. And that gives Pergamus time to get its act together. Because in order to get Pergamus, you got to get up that hill. So Pergamus was the more desired city. Thyatara is not. It's not. But here's the deal, guys. However, once Rome took over, they go Rome again. Once they took over in 190 BC, Thyatara would go on to become a wealthy little city with a booming commercial industry and home of, of a strategic military base, believe it or not, for Rome. In other words, Rome stationed the garrison there because they realized that Pergamus is the city everybody wants. So let us put a garrison down here in this little city so we can use this to kind of weaken the army before they get to Pergamus. But Pergamus, guys, it was a wealthy city. The city was known for its textile industry during the first century. Specifically, it was famous for its dying facilities, not dying like death, dying, dye, you know, dye, dying facilities. It was for purple dye, say purple dye, purple dye. which was very costly to produce and expensive to obtain. Why would you want purple dye? Who wore the purple? Kings, there you go. So you would come to Thyatara to get this purple dye, mom, which they had to extract either from a root. You had to extract it from a root or, this is amazing, they found there was a little fish called a Merlex fish. And they would take this fish and if you squeeze the little fish, you would get one drop of purple dye out of it. Mm. So that's why it was very costly to get, so which made it very expensive. So because it's very expensive, guess what, guys? The city was wealthy. As a matter of fact, if you read over in Acts chapter 16, verse 14, listen to this, guys. It says, one who heard us, this is Paul speaking, it says, uh, 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 us, was a woman named Lydia right, right. Mm -hmm. from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, mm -hmm. who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay, and she prevailed upon us. In other words, this lady Lydia was from the city of Thyatara. That was her home city. She left Thyatara to come to Philippi. Well, why would she do that? Well, Lydia was the first convert of the Apostle Paul in Europe, and it is believed that she moved from Thyatara because of the corruption of the trade guilds there. Also, it is possible that she and her family could have been instrumental in establishing the church in Thyatara. Unlike Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos, guys, Thyatara had no known center for any particular god. In other words, it wasn't really a religious city. It was pagan. Their chief god there was Apollo, but Thyatara worshipped numerous false gods, guys. As a matter of fact, this is just a little side note to tell you the weirdness of these areas that we always pick it, you know, the churches in a bad area. I don't know, guys. This is the way these churches were. Just outside the city was this popular known as the Shrine of the Sambathi. At this shrine was a woman witch who was demon-possessed who would give you secret knowledge of the God. She was a soothsayer. So she was a popular attraction there. As you would go into the city, you would stop by this Sam Bathy, and, and she would be demon-possessed and do all these demonic checks and things, and then she would give you secret knowledge to the gods. It was a crowd favorite. Everybody loved it. Everybody went there. It is believed that this woman was a part of the temple priestess of the Babylonian religions and Baal worship within, within the area. And this is interesting. Say interesting. Do you know what the name of the city first was? The original name of the city, Gus, was Samaramus. Well, Samaramus. 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 Now, if you know anything about Samaramus, Samaramus is the wife of Nim was the knife wife of Nimrod. And remember, uh, she is she is known as the goddess of the Babylonian mystery religious cults. I think that's interesting about this city because this city originally was named Samaramus. And, and remember, Nimrod, Samaramis, and Tammuz was the false gods of the Babylonian mystery religion going by 
offers different names within different cultures. Now, we're not going to get into this today. We're probably going to get into this in the fourth, mm. the fourth message. But I'm going to show you how the names Nimrod, Shabbat, and Tabus, they just change names in different cultures. Wow. Baal, is the, it, he has changed many names. Mm -hmm. right. Even today, you can upset a lot of people. Today he go by Allah. He can go by Krishna. Go study out the name Allah. It's the moon god. He finds his root all the way in Baal. Baal changed his name. Nobody's worshiping Baal. Oh, they still worshiping Baal today. But he goes by many different names. Semiramis goes by many different names. If you were in Egypt, she was known as Isis. If you was in the Persian Empire, she was known as Estarte. If you're in Catholicism, she's known as the Mother Mary, but we're going to leave that alone until we get there. Keep that in the back of your mind when you think about Thyatar. Let's talk a little bit about these trade guilds. Anybody been in a union before? Put your hand you been in a union. It's okay. I know you do. I know you do. Yeah. Most people have been in unions. These trade guilds were like unions. But boy, they wasn't like the union you was at. <laughs> a trade guild is similar to a union, but unlike a union, these trade guilds were completely obsessed with idolatry. They had drunken, sexual immorality went on, and they were based in complete debauchery. In other words, guys, I want you to hear this. Each guild had its own patron god or goddess that it had to worship. In order to work in Thyatar, you had to be a part of a guild. Mm. As a matter of fact, archaeologists have discovered this in the world of Thyatar, that it was as what had the most developed guilds in all of Asia Minor. In other words, whatever industry you worked in. So, okay, let's look at it in the if, if Raymond we know is in banking. He would be in the banker's guild. Lindsay would be in the teacher's guild. Mom would be in the medical guild. Y'all follow me? And if you wanted to work, you had to be in the guild, which means that you had to participate in the pagan festivals that they had. You had to participate in the sexual immorality. You had to participate in the debauchery because if you didn't, you had no job. Wow. Now we're getting a little bit of backdrop for this letter. Each member of the guild, as a member of the guild, you were required to attend the feast to the gods, and you were required to participate in the drunken feast. So in other words, I don't want you to get this picture that you could have just slid on in and not did anything. Because I know you say, well, I would have wanted to get I just would have done No, no, no. They would have, well, why are you not into the debates? What's going on with you? <laughs> we don't see the sexual immorality and the orgies going on with you. Why are you just sitting here? Why are you not getting drunk? Get out. You're not a part of it. Now you're fired. Right? So guess what you did? You was a Christian. You had to work. So you get on in there. Get a little sexual immorality going on. Worship a little couple of false gods. A little tiny orgies in there. And then go back to church. Well, that makes sense because that's exactly what the woman leader was teaching. She was teaching the true servants of God to worship idols and engage in sexual immorality. So when you study this out of history, it's believed that she probably was teaching some type of antinomian. Hey, guys, you know, we, we know we all say God knows we have to work. God knows we need jobs. How are we going to take care of the church? So here's the deal, guys. He knows your heart. He knows that, that you're not really into this, but you've got to have a job. So go ahead and go to the feast. Do what you need to do. Come on back here. Maybe she went through a cleansing. Everybody so got forgiven again and they carried on like it was. We don't know. But here's the deal. We know that how these gills were is tied to what Christ, what this lady was doing. Mm. Amen. Wow. Isn't that interesting? You know today, man, you work on a job. It's a secular job. And, it, 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 and it's, it, 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 it's known to increase sin. But you're a Christian. You just say, look here, man, I know how to separate myself from what I'm doing. It's just a job to me, baby. Mm, okay. wonder what the one with the eyes of, mm. with the flame of fire is saying. Mm. 
And this answers the age-old question, man, should believers be bartenders? Should a believer be a stripper? See, see, think about what's going on in Thy Car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I was hey man, you know, it's a part of my job. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. That's exactly what was going on in Thyatar. Yeah. Guys, it's safe to say that being a Christian in Thyatar was extremely difficult and that you were going to compromise with the culture and continue to participate in the trade guilds. Now you see why Lydia left. Mm -hmm. Lydia got the heck out of Dodge. Because she realized I can't, I can't work there because I got to be a part of these guilds. Guys, this brings us to the church. The church in Thyatar was in a real difficult position in this city, guys. But unlike Pergamus, say unlike Pergamus. Unlike, unlike Pergamus, guys, Thyatar, they, they did not hold fast to the name of Christ. As a matter of fact, Lindsay, they have plunged head first into the things of Satan. We don't know how and when this church was established, but it's safe to assume that it was either out from the woman Lydia and her family, because Ruby says she got saved and her whole family was saved, so we can assume that maybe she went back to Thyatara and, and really, you know, because, you know, imagine you, 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 you know the Lord, well, what's the first thing you want to do? Well, man, I had some people in my hometown, man, I need to go talk to them. I, they need to hear this. And so she could have easily gone back and established church. If that's not the case, we know Acts 19.10 says that when Paul was in Ephesus for two years, all of Asia Minor heard the gospel. So either way it go, we can we can take either way. But watch this, mom. This is all this will interest you. History tells us, try to hear this. History tells us that by the end of the second century, there was no church in the city of Thyatira. Watch this. It had been completely overrun with false believers and consumed into the culture. By the, end of the second century, old Delinda, the whole church had been overrun with false believers. It was consumed into the culture. And watch this, watch this. It just became another temple. Mm -hmm. Just another church. Isn't that something? Yes. Guys, it wasn't persecution that destroyed this church. It was corruption. Internal corruption. Keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. You can never destroy a church. The only thing that can destroy a church is the people inside it being false. Mm -hmm. That's it. Let's look at the commendations. We're not going to get very far, guys, as you can see. Let's look at the commendations. Verse 19, are you there? Mm -hmm. I know your works, your love, your faith, your service, your patience, endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. Wow. You can't help but to notice that the Lord's commendations are brief. Very pointed. Right. It's almost like, man, he let this out the way. Because his, con his condemnation is much longer. <laughs> but he does give some very good commendations. He says that there was love there, there's faith there, there's service, there's perseverance in this church. But I, and I thought, this, and this is, a good, this is a good example. Just as the Lord sees the corruption in the church, he also sees the faithfulness of the true believers there as well. Amen. Isn't that something? Just like he sees the corruption of the false believers, he sees the faithfulness of the true believers. I love it, guys, that, 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 that Jesus isn't just a blanket judgment. Right. right. Oh, y'all give it over to it. No, because, you know, you got nasty and I'm not participating in any of that stuff. And I'm fired and I'm broke. And I ain't got no job. I mean, why, 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 why Jesus talking to me like that? Well, see, Nancy, would, this would have encouraged her. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's not me. Raymond, I know you go to them deal. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you hear what he's saying. Oh, Lord. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Don't put me there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Use somebody else. But isn't that something, man? The Lord sees the faith. Isn't that something? You can, even in the midst of going to a corrupt church, God sees the, the faithfulness of the true believers. Amen. And he's going to judge you based upon your works. He, in this, God, come on, man. He's not going to judge you based upon the works of the church. Yeah. He's going to judge you based upon your works. Mm -hmm. What have you done after salvation? That's good, guys. I like this, guys. Fair. Whereas Ephesus, 
had abandoned their first love, these true believers in Thyatira had love. And it was that love that led to service. I want you to see, guys, this, those four commendations, they go together. Remember he said what? Love, faith, service, and perseverance. Faith could really be faithfulness. So love led to what? Service. Faithfulness led to perseverance. The true believers in Thyatira had faithfulness, guys, which in turn led to perseverance. The true believers were holding on. Is that not what Jesus told them? Does Jesus Saying to the rest of you all in five tar, hold on to what you have. Right. Meaning that the true believers were holding on. They hadn't given into the debauchery of the gills. Maybe they were suffering too. Maybe they, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe the, and here's the deal. Watch this. Because maybe they want, oh man, you got to hear this. Because I want you to hear how these commendations, even though they're good guys, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But they can also be just basic religious good qualities. Because let's say if I'm a part of this church of Thyatara and I'm not going to the gills, I'm holding fast, but people in the church are not going to be Well, because you feel bad for the people who are not doing it, but you respect them, guess what? We can all come together and try to help out the ones who are not going. You get what I mean? I know because they're not going. Oh, I say, hey, man, I, I know they don't like to go. Hey, we going next week. But let's be a blessing to Nancy and them, you know, because I know she don't go. I'm thinking that in this church, you probably had a lot of that going on. Because guess what, guys? Jesus commends the church for love. Mm -hmm. He commends the church for things, for serving. He commends the church for, for, for faithfulness. And I think those are qualities, though, although good, you can find them in any religious organization. Because notice what Jesus doesn't say about this church. There's no mention of sound doctrine. Yeah. Faith, service, and perseverance means nothing if they are not grounded in sound doctrine, just as sound doctrine means nothing if it's not expressed in genuine love, faith, and service. Amen. <laughs> Who cares about love, faith, service, and perseverance? grounded in any bright teaching, right. but who cares about your high loftiness, polluted knowledge, and it's not being exemplified in love, faithfulness, service, and perseverance. They go hand in hand. Because we know in Ephesus, Jesus commended Ephesus for what? Patiently enduring, but not just patiently enduring, but bearing up his name. Meaning they were holding name in the midst of the culture. Even with old compromise and pergamus, Jesus says, you guys are holding fast to my name. Wow. But you see none of that in Thyatira. Except for the faithful true believers, guys, these commendations from the Lord, like I said, could have just been charitable qualities of any religious organization. Do you know, guys, when we get to Sardis, you have dead churches that the Spirit of God has gone from and departed years, but they do a lot of good. They're building a lot of wells in Africa. They're taking care of a couple of orphanages, sending missionaries out. Guys, do you know Man, they do a lot of good things, guys. But do not mistake it, guys. You can, good things does not mean that you are doing everything according to what the Lord is saying. Yeah. I don't know if you get that. Amen. Because there was no doubt some good things that were going on. Even to the point where at the end of verse 19, what does he say? Your latter works exceed the first. Meaning that you're, you're increasing. <laughs> Elder Charles, your love is more. You're even more faithful. You got believers working in the church. My God. We can't even get the college. You got believers working in the church in Thyatara. They're increasing. But remember, say remember. Remember. You're talking to the one who has eyes of fire. What do I mean by that, guys? He sees past all the love the faith, the service, and the perseverance, and he sees in you what no one else can see. Wow. That's true. As we're up here in the church, think about it. Praise him, think about it. He sees past your song. Oh, you sound so good, but I'm seeing your heart. The preacher, oh yeah, you, you really studied and did that, but you know I'm looking at that little weak ass heart. <laughs> Oh, I see you got your hands up. Oh, I see you enjoying the music. Oh, you look very, you look very churchy today. 
but I see past the church oh, I, I see past the pretentious. I see all. I see past all of that. That's what Jesus is saying. How do we know that, guys? I was looking at this, guys. With these type of glowing commendations, you would believe that this is a model church. This tells us that in Thyatira, they probably believed that they were doing well. This church is growing. <laughs> They're loving more. They're more faithful. They got people working. They ain't got stuff going on, guys. But man, again, Jesus says, I see past all of that. Second Timothy chapter 19 says, but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. And that leads us right into the concerns, which is where we'll cut off for today. Because we, we're just going to look at something. And then we're going to cut it off. Look at, look at verse 20. Are you there? But, man, here we go. <laughs> but I have this against you. Can you out of the universe saying, I got something against you? Guys, who cares what a human being has against you? Look at what the Lord is saying. I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. We're not even going to get past that verse today. Notice he says you tolerate. Say tolerate. 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 This word tolerate is a very interesting Greek word. It means this. This is what it means. It means to let alone, to allow, to permit. But watch this. This is the important part of the one I was looking at. It also carries with it the sense of being timid, mm -hmm. indifferent, mm -hmm. giving something respect that should not be. Mm -hmm. So in other words, when he says tolerate, he's not just saying you allow. Yeah. No! He said, not only do you allow, Jimmy, you're afraid to say something. Right, 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 right. That's it. You're afraid to call it out. Yeah. You're afraid to speak up. <laughs> Even though you know you got an issue with it, you know it ain't really right, but you won't say nothing. No. <laughs> Guys, if that ain't hitting you in the gut like it hits me in the gut, because there are a lot of things that we, a lot of people that we know, friends or family, you know they wrong, you know they in sin, you know that ain't right, but you say nothing because you're tolerating it. Jesus, because like me, we cowards at times. We don't want to say nothing. They didn't want to offend Jezebel. They didn't want to say anything, so they let it go on. <laughs> only am I permitting it I'm indifferent I'm giving it respect when it doesn't deserve any respect wow I don't know about you guys that, that just jarred me when I was looking it up look at this man let me read this in fact, one commentator says this as it relates to them tolerating Jezebel. They were paying too much, too much difference or deference to her spiritual pretensions mm. and failing to see and to show that the so-called deep things of this false teacher were real things of Satan. Wow. Mm. No, they, they didn't see that. They, 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 they were looking at that. So it's always a picture of the show when you, when you get in your car and you say, man, 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 you know, man, they, they really got to get their life together, man. Man, you know, every time we go over there, man, it's just so, and then you, well, why didn't you say that? Well, you know, I don't want to be offended. I don't want to feel nobody. <laughs> Watch this, Roscoe, ain't my place. Ain't my place. Ain't my place. Ain't my place to say nothing. Okay, say amen, say Alex. We're supposed to walk in love. 
Lord. Guys, you're not here. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear what Jesus said? What is the issue that he has with the church of Thyatira? You tolerate it. That's right. Wow. In the world do you become a church when you tolerate the leader teaching you to commit sexual immorality and sacrifice to idols? I'm teaching it. How do you become a church where the, you let the pastor teach you to commit it? Teach you. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> to worship is just gross false doctrine. <laughs> Ain't none of that in the Bible. <laughs> and you say nothing but continue to call tithe. Bless. <laughs> God is calling all of us a coward. Amen. Guys, the letter to Tar Tar is going to anger you. Because we're going to find ourselves here. The understanding is that this church allowed this false prophetess to espouse her teachings with zero resistance and zero opposition. Now watch this, guys. Let me, let me get ready to close. I got five minutes left on this clock. To most scholars, all right, now most scholars do not believe that this woman's real name was Jezebel. I don't think her name was Jezebel. As a matter of fact, nobody would name their daughter Jezebel. Right. Right. If me and Lindsay had a beautiful scholar, we told you we're naming her Jezebel. I believe that our parents will revolt. <laughs> you name that baby Jezebel. Right, 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 right. You know, so I don't think that. Just like, you know, we're not naming a son Judas. Right. No. <laughs> right. You know, you're finding very few Adolfs. There's just certain names you stay away from. That's right. You're not naming your child Lucifer. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I don't know. So I don't think that this woman's name was Jezebel. But I did some interesting digging, and you have to do a lot of digging, guys, from, from some scholars to see about this thing. The key to there is she's a Jezebel-like figure. Watch this. Although some scholars believe that she could have been the wife of the pastor of the church who was usurping her authority, and dominating and leading the church into gross error. Because she's a Jezebel-like figure. Mm -hmm. Who is Jezebel? Mm -hmm. Don't get quiet on me now. First Kings chapter 16, verse 29 gives you her introduction. Mm -hmm. It says, In the 30th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omari, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omari, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Now watch this. And Ahab, the son of Omari, evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. But watch verse 31. Listen to this, Lizzie. And as if it had been a light for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, he took for his wife Jezebel. Do you get how Jesus, how, how the verse is saying? Right, right. It said, if it was a light thing for him to already be evil, right. he compounded it right. by marrying Jezebel. Jezebel. Right. The daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar of Baal in the house of which he built in Samaria and Ahab made Ashtaroth and Ahab did more to provoke God of Israel to anger, the, uh, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Wow. Wow. That's saying a lot. That was some evil kings. <laughs> Ahab, you got to know a lot. The correlation is just this, guys. The real Jezebel led Israel into gross idolatry of Baal. This Jezebel type woman was leading the true believers to practice sexual immorality and worship false gods. 
Now let me close with this, guys, because we're going to end deal more with this on Wednesday and next week as well. Let me say a few things about this Jezebel. No Lord says she calls herself a prophetess. What does that mean? Is she a prophetess? No. She calls herself one. Watch this guy. Here is where we get. Now, there were numerous women prophetesses in the Bible. We know this. Nothing wrong with a woman prophetess. But here's the thing. None of them were leaders of Israel or leaders of tribes. Right, right. I'm going to say, Deborah. Deborah was a judge. Get your, get your facts right. The judges were not leaders. They were not leaders. Prior to the judges, there were no leaders. Judges just judged the people. You didn't get the kings and the leaders until 1 Samuel. So there are many prophets in the Bible. Many prophets in the Bible. Anna was a prophetess. We read about prophetess of Paul, guys. But watch them. None of them were leaders of churches. Furthermore, there are numerous women in ministry in the church alongside with the Apostle Paul. In other words, there were many women who helped Paul. They, they, they ministered alongside with Paul. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? They ministered alongside of Paul. But there were no women elders. There were no women pastors. That's New Testament. In the Bible, guys, we only find men who left the church. Amen. I'll stop now. First Timothy. Don't go to First Timothy. Go to First Timothy chapter two. Y'all quiet now. I went to run out of off the pulpit. I'll say it again, guys. Many women prophets. Women, many women. You can find them all throughout Phoebe, Priscilla, and Aquila. You can find them all throughout in the New Testament. But Roscoe, here's what you cannot find. <laughs> there was no women pastors of any churches. There were no women leaders of any tribes. There were no women leaders of, that were over the nation of Israel. And that only has to do with the order of God. Amen. But there were women ministers. There were women ministers who preached the gospel. There were women ministers who prophet, who were prophets. Okay. I'm giving you this backdrop because it's, it's important, guys. Think about Jezebel in the Old Testament. She was the queen. Yes, she was. But what was she doing with Ahab? Who who was over the kingdom? Jezebel. Who was over the kingdom? Jezebel. Jezebel. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, now we're going to stop. And I'll explain these words. Don't, 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 don't lose me before I explain them. Oh, Lord. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over men. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Guys, I know these verses have caused a lot of controversy in the church. <clears throat> but what it's saying is absolutely undeniable. Mm -hmm. Let me give you something, guys. The phrase learn quietly, I know you see that. That doesn't mean to be speechless. Go look it up. Paul is not saying to the woman, shut up. Don't say nothing in church. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying to be It means to be stillness. It means calmness. The amplifier of that is with all submissiveness, meaning Paul is saying the woman is to learn in stillness, being submissive to the authority. That's literally what he's saying. He's not saying be quiet. He's not saying... That he the phrase, though, that gets you, Mom, is do not permit. Mm -hmm. 
in the Greek, it is the word epitrepo. Mm. And with a negative adverb, y'all know what a negative adverb is? If you take epitrepo and you put un in front of it, which is not, mm. now it becomes negative. Right. Y'all follow that? Mm. Listen to what it means in a negative. This is going to blow you away. In the negative, it means to not allow someone to do something that they want to do. Mm. Wow. Mm. Come on now. <laughs> wow. Mm. Wow. Mm. Paul tells Timothy that even though women may want to teach and exercise authority over the church, Paul says, I don't allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. The reason why. Mm -hmm. Look at the verse. For Adam was first, and then Eve. The reason being is it goes by order. Right. And what happened, Roscoe? Yeah. Eve stepped over her mm -hmm. authority. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Bit the fruit, <laughs> gave it to her <laughs> husband. But when you look at the curse that God puts, yeah. here's what he says. He tells Adam, because you hearkened yes. to the voice of your wife. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean we don't listen to the oh, Lord. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think God's my wife. <laughs> Come on, man. Where would you be without your wife? Amen. What kind of stupidity would you be? <laughs> That's not what he's trying to say. Right. Amen. Amen. I ain't listening to you no more, then you're an idiot. <laughs> so the women, they're running home. <laughs> and if they didn't, good luck with the house. <laughs> It'll be a pigsty, bills would be overran. <laughs> We be doing stupid stuff. Right. We thank God for the women. That's not what he's saying there. But what he's talking about, guys, as it comes to the order. Yes. No. Eve convinced her husband to sin. Mm -hmm. And it's the same example of what we're looking at with this woman here in this church. Mm -hmm. She had been able to rise to a seat of authority. Yeah. That's why I'm, I'm like the strong probably wife of the pastor. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just like Ahab was the king. Okay. And he let Jezebel mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. When Jezebel says, I'm going to, uh, we're going to have tables for Baal. Oh, Ahab, we ain't putting no Baal tables in here. Now, baby, I love you. You put in the decoration you want. But we ain't putting them Baal. That's all. Yeah, shut it down. But Ahab allowed it to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just like the leader in Thatar, he just allowed it to happen. In Titus chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But as for you, teach what accords to sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and steadfastness. Watch this! Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, are slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is... They are to teach! They are to teach! They are to teach! I thought Paul said we can say that you are to teach. Teach what though? Teach what is good. Right. So to train the young women yeah, to right. love their right. husbands That's and their right. children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemy. <laughs> and Paul calls that sound doctrine. <sighs> Paul literally says, the women are to teach the young women. The older women are to teach the young women. And literally, guys, if you study our church history, any woman that was over 60, they were supposed to be teaching the younger women. Amen. Women have a platform. But the sad part, I'm talking about the women here, the sad part is most women don't want that platform. They want this platform here. They want to be over ministries. And God says, no. You have a platform. You have a thousand, millions of women that need to be listened to you. Oh, such a godly, beautiful woman. Raise good kids. Oh, my God, man, what can you pour into the next generation? Amen. I think we know now. Look at the next generation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the older women, we ain't doing no better. Older men, I'm sorry. 
And if you try to hit me with, well, that was to that church doing it. No, because that's written in the pastoral epistles. Right. Meaning it's to all pastors at all times, everywhere. Now we're going to go a little bit more on that on Wednesday. So, <laughs> it's our beginning part as we get the backdrop of this letter that I'm talking I still love you. So, do not share Facebook. I'm not saying a woman cannot minister, teach. I did not say that. Roscoe, did I say that? <laughs> did I say that, Jimmy? <laughs> but what did I say? Yeah. Exactly what the Bible said. Amen. There were no women pastors. That's right. No bishops. There were no women of the tribes. In Israel. He ain't know the Charles. You gotta take it up with God. If you think that I just made I'm saying this, I've always thought this. God, me and my dad used to talk about this. I always used to say this. I said, oh, no, I believe in this. Oh, no, I believe in that. I said, but I, I don't see in the Bible where they were pastors of church. I said, that's all that's all. That's right. It's tight, but it's right. But it sets the stage for thy talk. <laughs> Stand to your feet. If you can. I don't know. I don't know. Let's start. You want to know something? Can I say something about the women that, that, that we have? We don't want to. I do. <laughs> you know, Liz ain't trying to pass <laughs> Mom ain't trying to pass them. But here's the deal, guys. <laughs> when I need advice, you know who I talk to? The women. I talk to my wife. I talk to my mom. Advice right, who you talk to? My boy, yeah, that's your problem. You talk to your friend. You talk to your wife. That's right, exactly. Why do you think she there? That's right. She, she knows you better than your buddies do. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, guys. Other women here, they're not, the other little's not trying to. Do that. I need to teach. I need to preach. You need to give me a church. No. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. Because, guys, the scriptures are clear. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not popular, but it needs to be said in today's culture. Mm -hmm. And it helps us get the backdrop of understanding the mm -hmm. Especially, guys, when we dig deep, deeper and deeper into the life. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. We'll close out the broadcast. Thank you guys for joining with us. Uh, please like our page. Uh, if you can, if you want to, like our page, Eternal Purpose Fellowship. Also, subscribe to our YouTube page, Eternal Purpose Fellowship, on YouTube as well. Don't forget, we'll be joining with you again on Wednesday, 7.30. Uh, we'll be back online again. Uh, so please join with us then. Uh, until then, I'll see you on Wednesday.